All right, uh, we're going to continue our study of the infancy narratives. And we are now, having completed Matthew chapters 1 and 2, we're going to look at Luke chapters 1 and 2. So Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. So there's three uh, three issues we want to look at there. First of all, we know from what he says that others have already begun to write things down. Now we might speculate, is he referring to Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel? We know Matthew wrote first, so and possibly Mark before Luke, but we don't know for sure about that. But definitely Matthew has already written his gospel down. Is that what Luke is referring to? We don't know. Could be. Could be something we've, that's been lost. Some writings, early apostolic writings. He could be even referring to something like the Didache. <laughs> Who knows? But whatever the case may be, he's, uh, he's aware that others have written some things down. And he wants to write things down now. And his sources uh, are eyewitnesses. He's, and he now wants to do this so that this individual, Theophilus, may have more certainty and clarity about what he has already heard. Look what it says, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. All right, so here's two other points. First of all, who is Theophilus? When we hear the name Theophilus, it sounds to us like a name, right? I mean, like Bob or Fred or, you know, or John. These names in English don't mean anything to us. In fact, we're accustomed to hearing names that have no meaning. Occasionally, you'll get a name that has, it's an English word, destiny, right? Or joy, or something like that. But for the most part, most people have names and they don't have any English meaning to them. So when an English reader hears something like this, we automatically assume this is some guy named Theophilus. Well, if we just simply translate it into English, then it might make a little more sense to us. And that is, friend of God. If this said friend of God, it might it might lead us to think, well, wait a minute, maybe this is a reference to his audience, right? We might begin in a homily. Uh, often when I'm speaking to children, I, I talk to them, uh, I address them as friends of Jesus. This is language that is easy for a child to understand. And so, oh, friend of God. Theophilus, right? God lover. Well, dearly beloved, right? And so uh, this is most likely not an individual, but rather a term of endearment for his audience. Another reason why that's most likely the case is if Luke is going to end up writing two books in the New Testament for some guy, you think we'd know something about him. And there's no references to this guy in the early church. Where is he in Acts the Apostles? Where is he on the Pauline Epistles? Don't you think, you know, Paul, who, you know, was, you know, Luke's master, there might be some reference to this guy Theophilus. But no. Again, most likely, as far as we can discern, this is a term of endearment for his audience. Oh, friend of God. And then finally, the last point I want you to look at, he says that you may know of a truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. Notice Luke's text is not intended to convert you from Buddhism. It's not intended to be hidden in a drawer in a Best Western and hope that you're going to come to Jesus. It is intended for being read in a liturgical setting to be read and heard by an audience of Christians when they've gathered together. As any commentary written by anyone with a any degree will tell you today, all the books in the New Testament are written that way. They're written for Christians to confirm, to clarify, to exhort. Paul's epistles, for example. Okay. Uh, and why is that important? Well, that means that you really appreciate what Luke's saying here. You've already got to be a fully catechized Christian part of a community and know this stuff to be able to read it and appreciate what he's saying. 
right? And you've got to be catechized in the way Luke's audience was, which tragically is very different from many Christians' knowledge of the faith or of the Old Testament than in the first century. Uh, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah and his wife, his wife of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elishavah. Elizabeth. Now Luke doesn't have to tell us names. He could just tell us there was a priest. And he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron. Would have been perfectly fine. We wouldn't even have noticed it. But he gave us these names because the names mean something again. Zechar, Raya, Zakar in Hebrew means remembered. And Yah is the first half of Yahweh, the name. Okay? So this is, you're going to translate the name, it's Yahweh remembers. Or Yahweh remembered. And then, the, then look at this name, Elishava. Elishava, God of oath. God of oath. Now those two things should point... Got some visitors here. Okay. Everyone remember to mute yourself when... Uh, here, let me see here. Mute all. There we go. All right. Uh, so... Elishava, uh, God of Oath. These two names should point us to. These two things should point us to the same idea. If you go and look in the Old Testament, where is the first occurrence of God remembering? Do you remember? God remembered. Close. It's in the good in the Noah story, and God remembered Noah. Remember that. He remembered Noah. This is uh, Genesis 8. He remembered Noah and those with him in the ark. Now, when that does not mean that God forgot and suddenly recalled what he had done. Oh, no, there's a boat down there. But it's, he remembers, he keeps his covenant. Because in chapter 7, he had said, I will make my covenant with you and all those in the ark with you to keep life on the earth. So when you hear God remembering, look in the context, it's in reference to a covenant somewhere in the, re- in the context. And so we're talking about covenant. God of oath. When does God swear an oath? When He's making a covenant. right? What is covenant? Covenant is restoration. Restoration of a relationship in the Old Testament. Today we say covenant or contract is something, we're making, we're making something new. But the covenants of the Old Testament, the Sinai covenant, the covenant with Noah, the covenant of Abraham, these are restorations of a relationship that was lost in the garden. These are, these are preliminary stages of restoration that will finally come to fulfillment in the full restoration of the relationship of God-man in the God-man Christ Jesus. Right? Okay, so then we're talking about covenant. Now, why is this important for Luke? Because it's not, it doesn't strike us as all that significant, maybe. But if you were a Jew in the first century, and you'd been living for 500, you know about 500 years or more since it's been, since the glory cloud has been in the temple, since the ark was there, since there was a king of the line of David on the, on the throne, where is the covenantal fulfillments that God promised? All the prophets said that these things would be fulfilled. What's, what's, where is it? So he's showing us that what we're about to read is going to be the fulfillment of those promises of the covenant. And they were both righteous before God, walking the commandments of the ordinance of God, blameless, but they had no child. So he tells us blameless because it was often, as we even do today, we think, you know, if someone, something wrong happened to you, it must be because of something you did, right? Uh, so remember when the apostles say to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, he was born blind? He says, neither. Right? You know, sometimes bad things happen to us because of stupid things we do. Right? Bad things happen, sometimes because of bad things you do. But it's not like simply God's, you know, God, God's not just punishing you because of something you did. So um, if you, uh, you know, you're dying of lung cancer and you smoke cigarettes your whole life, it's not because God's, God's not punishing you with lung cancer for smoking cigarettes, right? It's the result of your actions. It's the result of your actions. So anyway, these people were, they were barren. 
And people would often assume that, well, there must be something wrong, there must be sinners. So Luke shows, no, 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 these, are, these people are perfectly righteous. They are barren because this is going to show forth the miraculous events that are about to take place. So verse 8, Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, he was of the division of Abijah, remember it said. Now Abijah was the 8th division in a 24 division cycle. In First Chronicles chapter 24, by the time you get to David's time, there are so many priests of the line of Aaron, they can't all fit in the holy place at the same time. They can't all serve. And so the line of Aaron, the family of Aaron, by the time you get to the time of David, 500 years later, so many of them, David decides to make uh, some order out. He divides the family of Aaron into 24 families or divisions. The division of Abijah, one of the families, was the eighth in division. Each family would come, each of these divisions would come for two weeks out of the year and serve in the temple. So this is his turn. He's in the the temple for two weeks. So it says, While he was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, it fell to him by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, when we hear about burning incense, we might not think of all that, you know, burn incense, okay, it's, it's something, you know, in the Eastern Christian tradition, this is a big deal. In the West, it's kind of fallen away from usage. But either way, you're still not grasping it here. Incense, the offering of incense, this was done in the morning and in the evening, and it goes all the way back to the Exodus story. This goes be back before the golden calf. In the morning and in the evening... It was called the Tamid offering, the continuous offering. It's recorded in Exodus chapters 29 and 30, if you're taking notes. And every morning and every evening, the priest would burn incense on the altar of incense while a lamb was being offered out on the altar of burnt offering outside. But the better job was burning the incense. You'd think, oh, offering a lamb? I mean, wow, that's big stuff. No, you're outside the meeting tent, and it's smoky, it's messy, it's dirty. The higher jobs were in the holy place. You went into the tent, and the highest of all jobs, only second only to the high priest job once a year. This job, beyond that high priest job once a year to go into the Holy of Holies, the priest would go in in the morning and the evening and sprinkle incense on the altar of incense. And the altar of incense stood right in front of the curtain that was the entryway into the Holy of Holies. This was the closest you could get to the ark to the glory cloud, to the presence of God. And you got to offer incense, this pure offering, which goes all the way back to the story of of the Exodus. This is the moment of prayer. You're standing in the presence of God and you're offering incense, right? Psalm 140 or 141 in the Masoretic numbering. Let my prayer arise like incense and lift up my hands like an evening sacrifice. So he comes in And he's going to sprinkle incense. Now, as far as can be discerned from statistics, the numbers of priests in the time and the divisions, this would have happened, this would have fallen by lot to a priest to burn incense on the altar of incense once in a lifetime because of how many there were. And if it went to one, they'd pass it over until everybody in the family, and only if everybody in the entire division had gotten off for incense, did finally somebody else eventually get a second try and a second turn at it. So this is a unique opportunity for him. He's going into the holy place to stand right in front of the Holy of Holies in the presence of God and offer incense. And it says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside. This is chapter 1, verse 11 of the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 1, verse 11. And... They're all praying outside. Why is this? Because during this time, the Levites were singing the Psalms, the lambs being offered out on the altar, and the priest is in there offering the incense. Let my prayer arise like incense. This was the great moment of prayer that you hoped your prayers would be answered. So people would gather in the morning on the way to work, and in the evening on the way back from work, they'd stop at the temple and pray. This was morning and evening prayer, orthros and vespers. Okay. All right, so then, this is, by the way, why during Vespers, the offering of incense is why, so central. And so it says that when he came in, it says, And there appeared to an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And he said, How cute! How cute! No. Why is that? Because he didn't see Cupid. Okay? When we think of angels... We're thinking of a pagan image. We're thinking of a fat, 
blubbery, rolly baby with wings, sometimes decapitated. And then we have all sorts of exclamations of why, you know. But these are images that go back to the Renaissance period when the Renaissance artists were borrowing imagery from pagan artwork. You know that the Renaissance artists were great artists, but they were not necessarily always the greatest Christians. They have one side of the studio, they're painting a picture of Venus and Cupid fluttering around her. And then on the other side of the studio, you got the Virgin Mary and Jesus and some angels. And so what happens is during the Renaissance period, pagan concepts of art and imagery start to infiltrate and infect Christian art. And we're still haunted by it, unfortunately, at least in Western art today. Although I'll just say in the East, I've sometimes seen some artwork sometimes that you can see the relationship there. But the what does he see? He doesn't see Cupid. He doesn't see an overweight baby fluttering around. He sees something that terrifies him. In the Bible, and in Christian art, always before the Renaissance, angels always are appeared as a man with a sword. Why is that? Well, because when angels appear in the Bible, usually someone dies or lots of people die. Right? The entire Assyrian army was wiped out by one angel. Think of the angel of the Lord that went through and the angel of death in the, book, in the story of the Exodus. You don't mess with these guys. If they're not appear, appearing as a, a, a man, and again, it's always a masculine, it's not a, an effeminate Swedish half-man, half-woman thing. It's always a strong soldier-looking man with a sword, part of the army of God, or the image is of an animal-type creature, like a cherub from the, uh, from the Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel chapter 1. All right, anyway, so he's terrified. Now, he's also terrified not only because he sees. Okay, you see an angel, I guarantee you're going to be scared. Every time an angel appears in the Bible, someone thinks they're going to die. Two, he's a son of Aaron, and he's offering incense for the first time in his life, most likely. Now, you've got to rewind way back to the Old Testament and remember when the first time incense was offered by a son of Aaron. The first time incense was offered by a son of Aaron, it's recorded in the book of Leviticus, chapter 10. Aaron's offering the bull calf out there on the altar. His sons are offering incense and boom, they turn into balls of flames and die instantly. Right? They offered profane incense, unholy incense. They did something wrong. You think this guy's maybe nervous? Right? This is this is the first time he's probably ever done this in his lifetime. This is probably the high point of his, of his service as a priest. And and he call, he recalls the stories probably of what had happened before. So he's terrified. He's frightened. And the angel says, "Settle down. You know, you're not going to die." He says, he says. Uh, uh, Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, "Do not be afraid, Zechariah." For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Your prayer has been heard. Right? You can imagine what he's been praying his whole life at this moment, and especially now. His wife is barren. How is he going to pass on his priesthood? Right? The priesthood was the the priesthood was the the it was inherited back then. How can he pass on this great gift of the priesthood? If he doesn't have a son. So, we find that he's going to be able to pass on his priesthood. And the son's name is John. And this is critical for understanding John's job. John the Baptist, the priest of the line of Aaron. Really critical for understanding the rest of the story of John the Baptist. We'll get to that another time. And so, it says, his name is John. Now look at that name. Yohanna. Yohanna. God is gracious. Yahweh is gracious. When is he gracious? What does it mean? Gift. To be gracious means to be giving. When does God give? What is his ultimate gift? His gift is his law, his word. I right? think of John uh, chapter 1. The, the law came through Moses, but the true gift, the true grace comes through Jesus Christ. Right? All right. Verse, uh, so again, you can see all this is pointing, what Luke's showing us, what, giving us these names, pointing to what's coming. And you uh, will have joy and gladness uh, when, uh, and will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord and he shall drink no wine or strong drink. What does that mean? Well, he's going to be John the Baptist. Get it? No. All right. So, what does it mean? He's not going to drink wine. <laughs> it took a while there. Okay. So, 
What is it? He's not going to drink wine or strong drink. And he's going to live out in the wilderness. Well, he's probably... This is probably intended to be understood in some sort of like a Nazarite idea. We talked about this last week. If those of you are joining us online uh, or here, if this is your first time, and you're wondering about Nazarites and things, you want to go listen to our study last week. So he's going to be like a Nazarite, living out in the wilderness, away from the world, away from the feasting and, and, and all that. And it says... Uh, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Right? That's going to happen in verse 41. Right? When, when he leaps in the womb. Right? That's going to be later on. And then it says, And he will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him. He will go before whom? Who? Who? Before the Lord. Right? He will go to prepare for the Lord. Their God. He will go before Him. That is, before God. In the Spirit. And power of Elijah. Preparing the people, right? Like Elijah did. So, notice already, I pointed this out to you before, how many times you get references to the divinity of Jesus already in these infancy narratives. They're little hints. But you can see them right here in places like this. John the Baptist, everyone knows, is the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. When you go back to the word Lord in the Old Testament, look, that's all in caps in your, in your English Bible, because in the Hebrew, it's Yahweh. He will go to prepare the way for Yahweh. And then as you look at the rest of the story, John the Baptist is preparing for the way for Jesus, who is Yahweh saves, of course. All right. So then it says, He will go in the spirit of Elijah to turn their hearts to the fathers and children, the discipline, the wisdom, the just, and make ready the Lord, make ready for the Lord, a people prepared. Again, in English, we hear this, the Lord, oh, he's preparing for Jesus. Yeah, but grasp this stuff in light of the Old Testament. This is a prophecy from Malachi. In Malachi, 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 my messenger, there was a prophecy. This is a post exilic prophet preparing the people. They're waiting for the glory cloud to return to the temple. When is God's glory cloud going to return to dwell among his people again? And God says, he sends uh, the prophet Malachi, my messenger, to tell them that, well... I'm coming, but who can, who can endure the day, right? It'll be like a refiner's fire. We talked about this before. And the glory cloud, when it appears, will be like a, a massive forest fire. So God's going to prepare the people by sending the prophet Elijah to get them ready so that they're not all burned up. Right? And so this is Elijah's job, or John the Baptist. Now, does, is John the Baptist you know, possessed by the spirit of Elijah or something? No, you know, not something like that, the way we might think. He's going to go in the spirit of Elijah. He's going to be like Elijah. He's going to do Elijah like things in a con- historical context of Elijah. Right? Think of Elijah, the bad king at the time, and Jezebel. Here you got Herod and his wife, right? Who's going to end up cutting his head off and the whole thing. There's all this Elijah imagery. Elijah, the Jordan River. Here's John the Baptist, the Jordan River. More on that later in our theophany study. So he's going to go preparing the way. But Elijah is going to return. Elijah is going to return to the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is how you see multiple valences in fulfillment of the prophecies. The Word of God echoes throughout eternity. So in every, every epoch, every episode in salvation history, you see the Word of God echoing, being fulfilled and fulfilled even greater and greater. All right, so it says, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, my wife has advanced in years. So he's got a little doubt, right? He's getting a little confident now, right? Well, the angel didn't kill me, so maybe I can ask him some questions. And he wants some proof. And the angel said, I am Gabriel. You just made a big mistake. Do you know who I am? Right? Gabriel. Now, the word word Gabriel, the name, we've heard it before, of course, but where have you heard it before in the Old Testament? So two important things with this identification. I am Gabriel. Well, that's... God is mighty. God is powerful. This is like El Shaddai in the Old Testament, right? God all powerful. So obviously, Zechariah's question is whether or not this is my wife. She's old. She's advanced in years. Is this really even possible? Give me some proof. I am Gabriel. That is, God is mighty. He is able to do these things. So that's the first clarification for Zechariah, that he can do it. And then two, Gabriel first appeared in the Bible 
in the book of Daniel. Back in Daniel chapter 9, remember Daniel was praying during the hour of incense, the hour of prayer, his prayer arose to God and descend, the angel Gabriel descended and told him about the 490 years that the exile would go on, not just for 70 years, and it was now coming to a close at that point for Daniel, but the exile would continue. It would be 490 years, 70 weeks of years, Daniel. So the good news is the 70 years is up. You're right. You guys are going to go home. But it's 70 weeks of years until the exile is complete, until the restoration comes about. So your people are going to go home, but the, the restoration will not, not be complete until after 490 years. Why? 490. You hear that? 49. 70 weeks of years. 77. In the Old Testament, you remember, the Jubilee year was the Sabbath of Sabbath of Sabbaths. You had the seven, you had the weekly Sabbath, the day of rest. You had the yearly uh, Sabbath of the seven years. But then every seven Sabbath years, the 49th year, the, day, the year after the 50th year was the Jubilee year. That was the eternal restoration of all things, right? And so the restoration of God's kingdom is described as the, as the eternal Jubilee, right? All right, so then... It says, he says, and that's, by the way, all that I just told you, that was Gabriel announcing that to Daniel, right? So I was there announcing this 490 years ago, and here I am to see the fulfillment. You probably should have listened to me. So he says, because you did not believe, he says, I am Gabriel, stand in the presence of the Lord, and I was sent to speak to you to bring you this good news, victory proclamation, the kingdom of God is being reestablished over its enemies. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things come to pass, because you did not believe my words, right? Good news is something to be announced. He can't announce it. He can't announce it because he failed to believe. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they received, they perceived he had seen a vision in the temple. They made signs of him and wondered. He remained dumb. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Oh, his priesthood! Right? This was his ultimate moment. And yet this was the greatest day of his life, right? He has heard the good news that the kingdom is going to be reestablished and he's going to ha- his prayer has arisen like incense. And he is going to have a son who, like a priest, is going to reunite God and man, right? He's going to reunite God and man together when he points out and says, Behold, there is the Lamb of God, right? I don't need to sacrifice a lamb on the altar, Right? John the Baptist is a priest. That's a priestly action. There he is. That's the Lamb of God. Unblemished Lamb of God. He is the sacrifice. He will save us from our sins. The fulfillment of the priesthood. Okay, so then it says, verse 24, After these days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she hid herself, saying, Thus the Lord has done to me in the days when she looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. Verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, we've already talked about Nazareth, right? That was our study last week. Nazareth, branch town, right? This is the place, this was a Davidic town. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. So you recall, if you, if you take these two stories together, they start out in Nazareth. They're going to end up in Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus to fulfill Micah. But they're going to eventually end up back in Nazareth. Right? They're going to go home. Remember at the end of Matthew's Gospel, we learned that after he returns from Egypt, they end up going back to Nazareth, which makes sense. These are both Davidic towns. Right? You go back to your people. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, right, branch town, house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, this is verse 28, Rejoice, O full of grace. The Lord is with you. Now, whatever translation you have, hail full of grace, rejoice highly favored one, None of them grasp it. You can't grasp this. There's no translation in any language that will work because of how the Greek, how the roots work and how they're able to play off it. When you try to translate from one language to another, 
A lot of times you can't, trans, there's some things that are untranslatable. This is one of those spots. It's a very beautiful passage. I'll show you how some of, these, some of this is untranslated. Rejoice. This is what it means. Here in the Greek. Here. This is a first century greeting. Rejoice. Be happy. But the next word, kecheritomene, is built off that same Indo-European root. Charis, grace. The thing which causes rejoicing. So, if I put it in English very clumsy, rejoice, you who have received the thing which causes rejoicing. <laughs> right? And, uh, and she says, but she was greatly troubled at saying, right? An angel showed up. <laughs> and, and consider in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel of the Lord said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found charis, grace, favor, the thing that causes rejoicing with God. So then, we'll come back to that uh, in a second. Do not be afraid for Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Okay, so what is Luke expecting us to hear right off the bat here in these words? Rejoice, highly favored one. We've got a young woman. And she's an angel saying to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. And we're hearing about her conceiving. All right? And we already know from up before in the story that this is a moment of a major salvific moment. He's hoping we're going to hear an echo from the Old Testament. The prophet Zephaniah. The prophet Zephaniah. And you say, How is it possible that they might hear an echo like what you're talking about? And prophet Zephaniah, I don't know. And. The reason that occurs to us is because we've been raised on MTV, right? We've been raised in our modern culture, right? Where we, we don't know the Old Testament prophecies because we've wasted our whole life hearing all sorts of nonsense, right? And maybe some good stuff too. But we haven't filled our minds with the books of the Old Testament. Think of how many books you've read since your childhood, since you learned to read, until today. The Jew in the first century, all those books you're talking about that you've read, any Jew in the first century who could read, all those books would have been Old Testament books. And if you couldn't read, think of all the books you've heard read, right? Think of all the books, if you couldn't read, you have heard read at this point, they would all have been the Old Testament. They had the Psalms memorized. All right, so let's go back to Zephaniah. How are you going to find Zephaniah? If you go back into your prophets of your Bible, your prophets section, if you go back into your prophets section, you'll find the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets and the minor prophets, okay? In your minor prophets, in your minor prophets, you'll find Zechariah. Zechariah. He's an easy one to find because he's 14 chapters. Zephaniah is very short. So you find Zechariah first, okay? Zechariah, and then rewind a bit, and you'll see little Haggai, and then you find Zephaniah. Now, these guys are at very different times. Zephaniah is a pre exilic prophet prophesying during the time of Isaiah, whereas Zechariah is post exilic but more on that another time. All right, now, Zephaniah is just like the book of Isaiah, prophesying at the very same time. It's structured very similarly. In fact, you have lots of parallels. But just like the book of Isaiah, which has two parts... 1 through 39, you're all going to die. Chapter 40 through 66, well, not all of you are going to die. right? It's restoration language. And so the same thing comes in Zephaniah. The first part of the book is you're all going to die. Second half is, well, there's restoration. Some are not going to die and there will be restor- restoration to the kingdom of God. Chapter 3 is that hinge uh, where we get that turning point. Chapter 3, verses 1 through Seven about there is the is the prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. So Zephaniah one and two is you know death and destruction and it's climaxing until you get the ultimate prophecy, chapter three, verses one through seven. Jerusalem will be destroyed. This is parallel to Isaiah thirty nine. Okay, again you can see the parallels right in Isaiah. But Isaiah forty, comfort, comfort my people, a voice crying in the wilderness. That turning point. 
the parallel of that in, in Zephaniah now is verse 7 and following, verse 7, 8 and following, where things start to turn. He talks about a restoration. Look what he says, how he describes this. He says, he says, uh, Oh, verse 11, on that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. So on this day of restoration. Now he's talking to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Right? Jerusalem was described as this harlot who had gone off and harlot herself off a wife that had become a harlot. But now he talks to Jerusalem in another way. This is after the restoration. He says, he says on that day you, O Jerusalem, shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones. You shall, there shall no more longer be haughty in my holy mountain. Though you know during the exile, when the Babylonians attacked, the wicked were killed. They died in battle. And those that were slightly less wicked were given mercy by being taken into exile. But the righteous remained behind. The poor righteous remained behind. You can see them. They were left behind. It says it in uh, 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. They were left behind. You also see a reference to it in Ezekiel chapter 9. Those who received the mark would be left behind when Jerusalem was destroyed. They'd be left in Jerusalem. And you hear a description of them being left behind. Sorry, Tim LaHaye. You get a description of them being left behind in Jeremiah chapter 40. They inherit palaces and things like that. I mean, there's whole palaces and, and uh, you know, Maseratis in the garage with the keys in the ignition. They get the whole thing. Because all the wicked were all taken away and most of the wicked were very wealthy and powerful. They were wicked. What were they wicked? They were polytheists. They were pagans. All right. So the, you have these... The righteous ones who were left behind in Jerusalem, and they become the seed of the restoration. Eventually, you have returnees coming as well that, that also feed into this, this new people of God in the post exilic period. It says, For I will leave in the midst of you a people humble and lowly. All right, this is the, the post exilic people. Uh, they shall seek refuge in the name of Yahweh. Right? They won't be pagans. Those who are left in Israel. They shall do no wrong and utter no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall pasture and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. These are all opposites of what we read about in the first half of the chapter about the wicked Jerusalem. And then look what it says. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Now he's not. Okay, that sounds interesting. Go to the Greek. Here. So you got there. Right? This is the word that we see in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. And it says, Shout, for, shout O Israel. Exult with your heart. Be glad, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has taken away the judgments against you. Taken away the judgments against you. Have you heard that kind of language before? Yeah, you're going to read about in the in the Magnificat. The king of Israel. He's cast out your enemies. You get that in the Magnificat, right? The king of Israel, who is Yahweh, is in your midst. This is awesome, right? This is, a, this is what you get in the, in the prophets. They talk about... The restoration is when God, the King of Israel, again reigns supreme over His people. Look at this language. Yahweh, the King of Israel, is within you. He is within you. Now, at one level, this is a prophecy of eventually the glory cloud returning to His people, right? But did that glory cloud ever return to His people? No, if you read the post-exilic prophets, that's the problem. The post-exilic prophet part problem is that there is no glory cloud returning. Ezekiel promised, chapter 43, the glory cloud would return after they rebuilt the temple. It never showed up. And the reason is because the temple that Ezekiel saw in which the glory cloud returned to was not the temple of Zerubbabel. He saw what we're seeing right here. He saw what we're seeing right here. That the ark of the Lord is not an acacia wood box in the new covenant, but the womb of a woman. 
And the Word of God is not going to come back to His people on stone tablets, but in the flesh of man. Because the new covenant is incarnate. This is the fulfillment of Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and following. A new covenant I will make with you, O Israel, not like the one I made of old with your fathers at Horeb, Mount Sinai, which they broke even though I was their husband. This new one I will write in your flesh, in your heart. You get this in the other prophets as well, in the exilic and post-exilic prophets. In Ezekiel 36, I will take out your stony heart, put your fleshy heart, all that. So Luke's trying to show us this. Now, if you read through the rest of Zephaniah here, the end of it, do not fear, be not afraid, O daughter Zion. God is within you. Rejoice. Uh, look at what it says in verse 19. Behold, at that time I will deal with the oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. Right? If you've ever read the Magnificat, you can't help but hear all the echoes here, Right? Luke tells us that Magnificat, hoping this is part of the story. He's hoping you're going to hear all this stuff. Right? There's lots. There's lots of layers of this in so Luke's like, gospel. So yes. Yeah. Review that. that, that so you said that the structure for like uh, Chayre, yeah, Magnificat, Shomene, yeah, um, and the Lord is with you. Is like rejoice and then as I was full of grace, the daughter. Yeah. Uh, same thing, right? Uh, the Lord is with you. So right. it has the same. So yeah. Like, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, yeah. So this is, this is something Luke's going to hope we're going to hear. And again, you say, well, how could we hear that if we don't? Well, first of all, the problem is our English translation. Most English translations, the translators, you know, a translator's usually a good linguist, but doesn't have a lot of, you know, theological background, not enough, and um, an exegetical study. And so a lot of times the translation is weak because the translator's lack of, you know, of knowledge of the parallel text. So anyway, so then... Let's go back to Luke's Gospel now and see some more stuff here. Luke says, so daughter Zion, so what are we seeing here? Hopefully we're hearing a fulfillment of the of the Zephaniah, that the Old Testament is going to be fulfilled. Mary here is being is the personification, the the ultimate, you know, the, the intimate and concrete fulfillment of this people. Daughter Zion is the post exilic righteous people who are preparing to receive the glory cloud in their midst again. And this is ultimately fulfilled not only in this post exilic period, but ultimately in one individual, right? This is Mary, who is the, the pinnacle of this entire, entire people, daughter Zion. She is daughter Zion of daughter Zion in a certain sense, right? Okay, so then, it says, uh, he will, uh, I'm sorry, verse... 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Yahweh Saves. Now, we already talked about that name in our first study, so you can go back and look at that. This is Joshua, right? The Joshua of the New Testament. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to the first study. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. This is 2 Samuel 7, right? This is a very important prophecy. Again, we talked about this when we talked about Jesus being the son of David in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, right? Son of David, we heard. So again, if that it doesn't make sense, you can go back and look at that. So he will inherit the throne of his father David, that great promise in 2 Samuel 7 that the dynasty of David was the only dynasty to rule rightfully over Jerusalem over God's people. Okay, so what are we hearing so far? We, we're hearing also that this child is going to be the fulfillment of this promise. He's of the line of David. We already talked about how that's possible through adoption with Joseph in, um, in uh, our study of Matthew's Gospel. But you already heard something else going on, and that is that reference to Zephaniah, that this is not just some boy of the line of David who's going to fulfill the Messianic prophecies. He is the king, not only the human king, but the divine king. And we had a hint at already, for those who had ears to hear, the echo in Zephaniah. The Lord, Yahweh, your king of Israel, will be within you. Right? But we get more hints at that, and in fact it screams at us in a second. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I know not man? I have no husband. Learn the great, I know not man. What does this mean? Now, this is a funny thing to say for a girl who is betrothed, right? Imagine walking up to a girl who's engaged, about to be married, and you say, you're going to get married, and you're going to have a boy. 
And he's going to be a great man. He'll be president of the United States. What girl who's engaged and about to be married would say, What? How is that possible? Right? What do you mean, how is that possible? I mean, you don't know the birds and the bees? I mean, you're, you're getting married. What do you think is going to happen? So, what, is it, what does it mean for I know not man? Well, what we're getting here, as we talked about before, we'll talk about again, is a reference to the early church understanding, the apostolic period understanding, that you see it in other literature as well, that Mary was a temple virgin. You have these temple virgins, references to them all the way back in the Old Testament. You get a reference to one in Exodus chapter uh, 38, verse 8. The, the women who missed at the door of the tent of meeting. You get a reference to them in Second uh, in First Samuel chapter two. The sons of Eli were lying with the women at the door of the tent of meeting. They got in trouble. They're obviously not their wives. So these are dedicated virgins who minister at the door of the tent of meeting. We see references to them then also in the early Christian literature. And we have a hint at it right here that Mary was a temple virgin, had been dedicated to the temple. You can read about this in the Proto-Evangelium St. James. We'll more about this. But anyway, she, she's taken a vow of virginity. She's betrothed to Joseph, who's an older man, a widower, which is where, who some of these brothers of Jesus are. And he's supposed to be taking care of her, watching over her as one of the men of the village who would be, could be trusted to care for her. So these temple virgins had to be married off at age 12 out of the temple because they began to menstruate. So, for I know not man. So he says, oh, don't worry about that. We'll take care of that one. Like he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Will overshadow you. So what are you, what are you hearing there? The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Well, we should be hearing something that we often miss because of the English again, a very important Greek word. The word translated in English as overshadow, while being a very perfect translation of this word, epi, on top of, over, skiadzin, to, to uh, pitch a tent, to dwell, overshadow. In fact, skiadzin, to pitch a tent, comes from skia, or skia to a, a shadow. Right? So, overshadow is a very perfect translation of the Greek here. But, unfortunately, we're missing often these parallelisms from the Old Testament with these translations. This word, episkiadzin, overshadow in English? Well, overshadow. Episkiadzin, to a first century Jew hearing this in Greek, he'd flip out. Because episkiadzin is a word in the Greek Old Testament, in the Septuagint, that is a technical term. That is, it's a special word that the translators from Hebrew into Greek reserve for only certain situations. Okay? What are they, where is an example of this? Hold your hand here and flip back to Exodus chapter 40. In the Old Testament, so we'll go back to Exodus 40. In the Old Testament, when the Hebrew is translated into Greek by Jews 200 years before Christ in what we call the Septuagint, which was read in all the Greek-speaking Jewish synagogues in Palestine and in Jerusalem, and from which the New Testament authors quote, of course. When you hear episkiadzi in the Greek text of the Old Testament, it's always always, always translate in every occurrence the Hebrew verb shakan, from which you probably have heard the word shekinah, the Aramaic noun, shekinah, or as you might have heard it, the shekinah glory, if you listen to Prophet Radio. So anyway, the shekinah, this is the, the visible glory cloud dwelling of God. Why is that in the rabbinic literature like that? Because of what we're talking about here. They... When you're in Exodus chapter 40, the glory cloud descends upon the tabernacle, upon the ark. This is verse 34. Look at verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. Moses just finished building the tabernacle, right? And the glory cloud fills it. And look at what it says in verse uh, 35. And Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting. This is verse 35. Because the cloud rested abode upon it. You see that word? Highlight that word rested or abode, whatever's in your translation. 
This is the glory cloud resting. This is in the Hebrew shakan. Now shakan just means to rest or sit down in Hebrew. But when the translators in the Greek translate the verb shakan in reference to God resting on the ark, they always use episkiadzin and they never use it for anything else. So what is Luke trying to show us? Well, he's not trying to give us a new Marian devotion, as we might think. What he's trying to show us is, again, something about this baby. He's trying to show us something about this baby. This baby is not just of the line of David, but as Zephaniah told us, is Yahweh the King of Israel. He is the Word of God in the flesh, in a new fleshy ark. And in case you missed it, he's going to now go on to prove that to you. He tells you now that, behold, your kinswoman, Elizabeth, in her old age, is conceived, and it was son, and this is the sixth month with God. For with God there will be nothing impossible, right? Gabriel. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country of Judea. Now, what went into the hill country of Judea in 2 Samuel 6, the chapter before 2 Samuel 7? The Ark of the Covenant, right? How long did it remain there? Three months, right? Let's keep reading. So, Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it granted me that, listen to this, the mother of my Lord should come to me? These are the words of David fulfilled. In 2 Samuel 6, David says, when he looks at the ark, how is it that the ark of my Lord should come to me? And then David leaves the ark in the hill of Judea, in the house of Obededom, for three months. Now, you remember what happened? Everybody in the household was blessed, it said. The household of Obededom was blessed. And if you don't know what that means, you've got to go back to Genesis chapter 1, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Uh, you can even see it in that story in 2 Samuel 6. David then goes to his own house when he brings the ark in Jerusalem to bless his house, right? And he has to encounter Michal, his wife, who's not happy with him, and so she doesn't have any children. Right? We talked about that in our study uh, in, of Matthew chapter 1. Okay, so then, uh, so then Mary, Mary comes to Elizabeth, right? The ark comes to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, the priest, experiences the presence of the glory cloud and the ark, right? The priests had been going in to that holy place and offering incense and lighting the candles since they rebuilt it in the time of Zerubbabel. But guess what was missing all that time? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was not there. It had never returned in the, re- in the new uh, temple. The glory cloud had never returned. Jeremiah had hid the Ark. You know that from 2 Samuel chapter uh, 2. He hid it on Mount Nebo, which is why we know that Indiana Jones was looking in the wrong place, among other things. So the, uh, so the priest experiences stands right now before the curtain of the Holy of Holies and experiences that presence of God. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He leaps with joy, right? And so then we hear Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, we don't have time to read all of this. You know the Magnificat. There's not a Christian, hopefully, uh, that doesn't, hasn't ever read this. This is a very important, beautiful hymn. And if you read this hymn, you hear two very important references to the Old Testament. One, the story of daughter Zion from Zephaniah. The other one that most people are aware of is the story of Hannah. If you go back to 1 Samuel, you hear about Hannah who gave birth to Samuel. Do you remember that? And she rejoices and gives her Magnificat. And if you read the Magnificat, it's very similar to this Magnificat here. And this is hopefully, Luke's hoping you're going to hear this because guess what? At the end of Hannah's Magnificat, you get the first occurrence of the word Hamashiach, the Messiah, the Christ. The first mention in the Bible is in her hymn. Why is that? Because what is her name? Hannah. Chain in Hebrew is grace. Grace. 
This stuff is so rich here in Luke's Gospel and these cross-references to the Old Testament, the layers. We don't have time to get into it at all, of course. All right, so then look what happened. It says in verse 56, And Mary remained with her about three months. Couldn't see that one coming. Okay. Three months in the house of Obededom. All were fruitful. They all were blessed. That's fertility. Why is she there? Because she has within her life. She has God, the source of life. And where there is life, there will be fertility. And this woman in her old age comes to fruition. Right? She bears the son. And we hear that when the child is born, he is named John. Which recalls, of course, the entire story from before. And everyone marvels at his birth. And Zechariah then takes up this beautiful hymn. And look what he says. Verse 60. Seven, And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is the Holy Spirit spilling all out over all the place here, right? I mean, Mary's filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Elizabeth's filled with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist. Now Zechariah. This is a little, you know, I mean, it's a little early. It's not Pentecost yet. Well, I hope you know that the Holy Spirit was all over the Bible and the Old Testament too. And where is the most important occurrence of the Spirit? Do you remember why the Messiah is called the Messiah, right? Samuel pours oil, remember, on Saul's head, 1 Samuel chapter 10. That one didn't work out. But the Holy Spirit comes down upon him, it says mightily. After three strikes, Saul's out. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, David's anointed with the oil, right? The outward sign, a physical, material outward sign of an invisible, inward dwelling of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, that sounds sacramental. Of course it does, right? So David's filled with the Holy Spirit, right? This is the, the Messiah, the anointed one, Hamashiach, or Christos, the anointed one, is the one who has the Spirit. This is why we're called Christians, right? Because we're baptized into Christ, and if you're baptized into Christ, then you have the Spirit. You become part of the body of Christ, as St. Paul says. All right, so then, look what he says. It says, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed the people. He has raised up a horn of salvation. A horn? That's kind of weird. Well, a horn is the image of strength. In fact, some Bibles will just put strength here, because that's basically what it means. You've got to go back to the agrarian culture. These people shepherded sheep and goats and oxen. Right? If they see a coyote or a wolf attacking or a lion, that animal puts its horns down. I remember watching a YouTube video not too long ago about a, an, an, a, a wild ox that just took a lion apart with its horns, picked it up and just flung it in the air, and the lion ran off. Okay? So this is the symbol of strength for these herding people, these agrarian people who shepherd these animals. So you often get this in the Old New Testament. He raised up a, a horn of salvation, of strength. In the house of the servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets from old. So it's all been fulfilled that we should be saved from our enemies. Now, what are their enemies? The people see their enemies as the Philistines, the Romans, the whoever around them. But as we know, Jesus is going to save them from their sin, right? The Philistines may kill you, and so they're your enemy. But they can only kill the body. Sin is the real enemy that you have to fight against, you have to battle against with the swords of the Spirit because that enemy can kill the soul. All right, so he says, he says, to perform the mercy uh, promised to our fathers and remember His holy covenant. To remember His holy covenant. Remember we talked about this? Zechariah. To remember His holy covenant. And look at the next line. The oath, the oath which he swore to our fathers. Elisha, right? His wife's name is Elizabeth. To Abraham, to grant us that we be delivered from our enemies, the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. And holiness, the righteous, before all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. Look at this. Now, who's the Most High? There's nothing ambiguous there. God. For you will go before the Lord to prepare His way. That's Isaiah chapter 40. There's no ambiguity here. John the Baptist is going to go to prepare the way of the Lord of the glory cloud returning to His people. 
But of course, this is Jesus. To give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins through the tender mercy of our God when the day shall dawn upon us from on high. That's a reference, beautiful reference to Malachi chapter 4, right? That when the glory cloud appears like a, a forest fire devoured tree and root. This is Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 following. And, but, the, but you who fear my name, you will go out like calves from the stall when the sun of righteousness arises at the dawn. Right? So this is an image back to um, uh, John the Baptist being Elijah because that's when you get the Elijah prophecy in the, in the book of Malachi. And he says... Uh, through the tender mercy of our God, when the day shall dawn upon them from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. That's Isaiah, right? Isaiah, the restoration there in Isaiah uh, chapter 9. To guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So again, he's in the wilderness. Probably that image of the Nazarite there. Right? What's his job? To prepare the way of the Lord. To prepare the way of the Lord. But hopefully you're hearing that in the way a first century Christian would have heard it. To prepare the way of the Lord, the way of the Lord. That's Isaiah 40. And the Lord is Yahweh in Hebrew there. O Kyrios in the, in the Greek there. The Lord. And so we find here already in these infancy narratives before the baptism, before the resurrection of the dead, Matthew and Luke are reminding us, a Christian audience the first century, hearing these Gospels preached to us as we've gathered together for our Eucharistic meal, that Jesus is not only the Son of David, but He is the God of Israel from of old. And to Him be glory with His eternal Father and His all-holy and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever into ages of ages. Amen.